Bioremediation. We'll look at uh, some examples here using plants and bacteria to remediate contaminated sites. What is the population of bacteria doing here? It's eating oil. What is this plant doing? Reducing hexavalent chrome from a toxin to a micronutrient. We've created a mess and nature is dealing with it. If we don't help, then we'll continue our ever-increasing path towards mass extinction and loss of ecosystems around the world. Bioremediation is a growing field that can bring nature, cooperative, and cost-effective solutions to remediating contaminated sites. And there are a lot of them. From oil spills, heavy minerals contamination, agricultural, both fertilizer and manure runoff, solid waste pollution, plastic pollution, and many other select contaminants. Bioremediation is the use of microbes and their associated plants to clean up contaminated environments, particularly soils, surface and groundwater, and ecosystems impacted by contamination caused by human activity. But before we dive into the world of microbes, I want to tell you about the importance of using sustainable practices in all aspects of the work we do. Sustainability is the application of quantifiable practices that are measurable in terms of specific metrics. These metrics confirm reductions in energy and resource use, aggressive improvements in natural environments, enrichment of community, and parity of economy. This is achieved while working towards a zero net total impact to the sphere in which we, the individuals, the companies, communities, organizations, or governments are living and working. If the natural environment around us is not healthy, then we are not healthy. Sustainability master planning operates on the premise that sustainability can unify planning and land use, ensure that we are good stewards of our environment, community, and economy, and that by doing so we are better prepared for the challenges of today and the future. This is a process of holistic planning and management. Part of the process is developing a land use plan that enriches the environment and our community and economy. If the land use plan calls for built spaces, then we focus on brownfield sites and integrate an important degree of remediation and restoration. Also, the land use plan utilizes the natural resource inventory. This categorizes all aspects of the site and identifies at-risk environments, natural hazards, natural areas that can be integrated with other uses, and so on. It is important here to plan for connectivity of habitats. This guides us towards land stewardship based on sustainability. Another key component for the built spaces is an interpretive plan. This is part of the iterative education process, recognizing our sense of place through interactions with visitors, members, and residents. It involves the human and material resources of our community, ensuring that what we are doing is in keeping with the uniqueness of a place. This part of the planning also helps us understand the experiences gained from what we do here. This guides us to the learning, iterative education, so that our experiences can be shared with others to expand our knowledge and better use sustainable practices. In projects contemplating built spaces, we include a design-build plan. This embraces the use of sustainable practices, including a number of renewable energy methods, renewable materials use, appropriate architecture and scale for the location and community, and integration of use and needs with existing community resources and spaces. This is to multitask buildings, transportation, parks, businesses, and education. This guides us towards a zero net impact goal of sustainability. With these example plans, we revisit, iterate, if you will, with our touchstone of sustainability. Have we achieved the best land use plan, interpretive and education plan, and building plan? Through this reevaluation, reprioritizing may occur to optimize a sustainable result. 
we can then again follow the iterative process in examining the project's goals in terms of community needs, life of projects, economics, uses of project results, and enriching the environment and other achievements. Sustainability master planning makes the most of skilled team members who understand best management practices in the context of improving our environment, enriching our communities, and doing so through sound economic practices. Sustainability. With that backdrop, let's go to our first site. It's in Wisconsin, amid the farm fields and along the shores of the Great Lake of Lake Michigan. This site is site number one, a kerosene spill. The kerosene spill is on the water table in sandy soil and sand on the Door Peninsula along Lake Michigan. The site is in a beach, dune, wetland forest complex with very porous sediment over karst. It is located in the Great Lakes, Lake Michigan, near Green Bay, along the Niagara Escarpment. The site is within one of the inset bays shown here, near Bailey's Harbor and the Ridges Sanctuary. The Ridges Sanctuary in Bailey's Harbor was established in 1935, the same year as the clearing by botanist Albert Fuller with help from Jens Jensen, Emma Toft, Olivia Traven, and others. The sanctuary offers nature classes and protects an important boreal-like coastal wetland forest habitat on the opposite side of the peninsula from the Niagara Escarpment. Within the sanctuary, we find sandy beach ridges, over 25 of them in this protected microclimate lowland. But what are the ridges? How were they formed? If we look under the cedar swamp wetlands in the swales and the hemlock pine hardwood forests on the sandy ridges, we find strata of sediment that speaks of prehistoric rivers, fens, bogs, glacial tills, and beaches, as illustrated in this box diagram. These sediments rest upon the karst in dolomite bedrock of the Engadin Formation. Now the Ridges Sanctuary was created in an old valley, a Paleo River Valley. And this valley slowly filled up with sediment and then created bogs, wetlands, and shorelines. The shorelines are very young, less than 3,000 years old, along Lake Michigan, and mark the last stages of lake stabilization after the Ice Age. The Ridges Sanctuary sits atop karst dolomite and limestone that's full of holes, a cave forming process that allows easy access to the groundwater from any surface activity. Now this is important because in the community we're looking at along these harbors are lots of boating activity, restaurant activity, and so on. And one of the things that they do there is they practice the conducting of fish boils, a big cauldron of salty water in which they throw white fish, potatoes, and onions, and they serve that up around the fire. Now to get this thing frothing, what they do is they toss a can of kerosene at the base of the fire just as the fish is ready to be pulled out, and this boils and froths up, and all the fish oil catches fire. It's quite spectacular, and it's quite an event for tourists. But there's a downside. There are a lot of restaurants that do this in this community. So although this might seem like a small problem, it's a widespread problem. Now here's a site where the fish boil would take place and you can see a hole in the concrete on the sandy soil. What happens is most of the kerosene sinks into the soil. And when they have done this over decades, there's a lot of kerosene sitting on the water table. So I investigated the site. There's the usual kinds of things in a restaurant, propane, storage, grease traps, and oil stains. And one of the things you notice is that the caretaking of this has been a bit loose. So you find a lot of leaking materials that additionally add uh, kerosene, oil, other petroleum products into the groundwater. Now the initial reconnaissance was test pitting and shallow holes and trenches to outline the surficial extent of the kerosene contamination. That's that red outlined area in the map here. 
So you can see one of the pits here. And these were simple hand dug pits just to find out what's going on. The sandy soil felt greasy, it smelled of kerosene, and in fact, if you set a match to it, it would ignite. And when you look down into these shallow holes, well, there's the problem. Most of the kerosene seeped through the sandy soil, not burned up by the fishbowl fire, and is sitting on the water table as usable product. You can see the kerosene glint on the water table there. So a number of test pits resulted in identifying kerosene and other diesel range organics known as DRO. And the DRO concentrations were between 200 and 11,500 milligrams per kilogram. The concentrations are ignitable and the shallow water table is only three feet down and it's contaminated. And it's directly adjacent to the wetland sanctuary. So one of the things we needed to do was go in deeper and put in some test wells which would become water monitoring wells. This is a map of their location and we took some split core sampling which I'll show you now. Today we're at the Sandpiper and we will be drilling the monitoring wells to find out the degree of contamination from a fish boil. So we'll uh, actually get samples, put in monitoring wells, and we'll be able to test the water and trace any contamination or identify the lack of it uh, as from something as simple as a fish boil. So this is an example of uh, a phase two part of a remediation study where we first identify the extent of the contamination that we identified in the phase one. So the site, as I mentioned, is directly adjacent to the wetland complex that you can see here. And the restaurant is also along the highway. It's well known back then for its fish boils. Now this building was taken down and replaced by a nature center. So this remediation had to occur quickly. So here we are backing in the heavy equipment, the drills. This is a drill that allows percussion sampling of a core barrel by pounding it into the sand, which we'll do here and the core barrel is split. We'll recover the sample there. So the drillers set up the rig. They drill a hole. Here you can see the driller retrieving the core barrel as they pull it out of the well. And here he is opening up the split core sample and you can see how that works. Now as you look at these samples you'll see dark spots and we did get that piece that dropped by the way. And uh, those dark spots are actually uh, organic matter uh, broken down from petroleum. So we have here already quite a bit of visible and you can smell it uh, contamination such as that oil blotch sitting in the sandy soil and that sand that's brown it should be white so there's product kerosene all through this here's another core sample and again the brownish color is all from petroleum Um, but I just I take a little bit of the soil from the, the sample and put it in a jar and then if there's any petroleum in there uh, it volatilizes it fills up this airspace. So the petroleum aromatics the volatiles are caught in that jar and the sampler is punched through the aluminum top and sure enough we can read about 7.1 parts per million petroleum volatile products. Now, once we had the core samples uh, completed, I logged them, and we can make a core log diagram of what we see here. So you can see things like the gravel in which there's charcoal, because there was a fire here as well. So the stratigraphy of history is here. 
the town had a fire. And then you see all that sand. It's sand and pebbly looking material. Some of it's light gray to buff and some of it is brown to dark brown to even black. Where you see the brown and the dark brown and black colors, well, that is where the oil and the kerosene sit. And we can also see where the water table is. If you look at the diagram on the right, the core log on the right, you can see where we go from oxidized red material in the sand, which is above the water table with atmospheric oxygen in the pore space of the sand, and then where it's reduced below the water, and that's gray. Taking this information, we can make a composite cross-section that shows our soils, our sediments, and the bedrock. And we can start getting an understanding of where the water table is, shown here in a blue line, and the wetland down gradient just off to the right. And using this, we can identify the redox boundary. That's where the water table fluctuates slightly up and down, depending on how much rain or how high the lake is. And then we can simply better illustrate this by putting in that saturated zone above the bedrock. Now, using the sample data, we can also identify the extent of the contamination. So from the various core holes, in some we had a lot of product, that is kerosene and oil, and in others not so much. So I've outlined the highest zone in red, that's right below where the fish boil fire pit always was, and they would throw the kerosene and sit in there. Now groundwater movement would have pulled a lot of this away over the years towards the wetland and towards Lake Michigan, and that indeed happened. In this information, we can then make a cross-section that shows the uh, contamination plume as it's kind of flowing off to the right there, away from uh, where the pit and the fire and the fish boil occur in SPC2. Now, we don't have data all the way down, so some of this is projected, but using other geologic knowledge, I could put this picture together. So we can make a three-dimensional diagram, and as you can see here in the bottom diagram, those blue lines that are crisscrossing, those are fractures. They're fractures, they're vertical fractures in the limestone, and into that, all the oil and kerosene can seep and be moved further in the groundwater system. So we had to be aware and protect against that. In addition, in the middle diagram, you can see the basic outline of the contamination and then the red dotted line on the surface, the surface expression of it. Now we're going to look at some uh, installation of the uh, uh, monitoring wells. We have these holes that we took our core samples out. And here you can see the drillers uh, putting PVC pipe in the ground in those holes, backfilling it with sand and gravel and a little bit of grout, putting a cap on it so it doesn't get contaminated. And then uh, what we do is we put a, uh, a metal cap on top of the PVC cap in case somebody drives over it. And we have our monitoring well, and we can go in there every week or so and see how things are doing. And in fact, we got a lot of kerosene information out of that. So here you can see one of the samples of oil, kerosene, and organic matter all mixed together. I got thinking about this, looking at this kind of sand, and here again you can see another sample, brown, smelly, and ignitable. So what I got thinking about was, I bet you there's bacteria in that wetland, in the wetland complex, right behind where you see these buckets. And I took shovelfuls of the contaminated sand out of where we just sampled, and I filled up five of these buckets. And these are various test cases. And I uh, then mixed some of them uh, initially with uh, muck from the wetland. And the wetland muck has tens of thousands of species of bacteria. Some can remediate diesel range organics, such as kerosene. These bins are filled with DRO contaminated sand and sandy soil and mixed with muck 
from the wetland. Now some bacteria, when it's subjected to things like kerosene and oil, will die. Some bacteria will just sit there and put up with it. But some bacteria will actually thrive. How does it do this? Well, uh, in this uh, micro, photomicrograph image of oil and oil bubble, you can see bacteria actually attacking the edge of that oil bubble and changing it. So in this illustration of a petroleum oil spill, you can see the hydrocarbons and ideally the bacteria gloms on to the outer edges of the oil droplets and they react, they eat this and they oxidize uh, the oil. I'm going to show you that equation in a minute. And the byproducts are carbon dioxide and water and cellular material for the bacterium itself. Okay? So with this knowledge we can see that there are all types of bacteria in this case, this picture shows bacteria that was used in the Exxon Valdez and the Prestige oil spills. Those are in Alaska and Spain in the past. Now, check this out. We are uh, looking at a little jar of oil here. And I'm going to show you how the reactions work. So first, we're going to make a hydrocarbon compound. This is oil with carbon-hydrogen chains, okay? And then let's say that this oil is spilled. Those are the dots. And then we're going to bring in some bacteria. Now the bacteria are going to glom on to that oil. And what they're going to do is take that CH3, that component of the uh, carbon chain that makes up oil, they're going to oxidize it. That is, they're going to add oxygen. And they're going to break that carbon-hydrogen chain down, creating carbon dioxide and water and that is the oxidation process now why does the bacteria do this because they pull some of that carbon out and make cellular material enzymes and so on and so forth proteins for the cell itself and so the byproduct of this uh, bioremediation process is carbon dioxide and water and the oil is remediated it's amazing So here's other types of oil that have been used in various environments. And I just want you to see what these bacterium look like. This one converts alkanes and oil into microbial cells, carbon dioxide, and water. And it's found in the Gulf of Mexico and the Black Sea. In fact, all around the world. Here's another one. It breaks down carcinogenic compounds, those polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs or PAHs, in oil deposits. And this occurs worldwide. And this one, Olispira, converts oil into more Olispira cells and cellular material. And carbon dioxide and water, of course, is a waste. And this one, Coelia, is found in the waters from the poles to the equator and can even thrive in marine sediments. So this stuff is everywhere and in fact in wetlands. Here's another oil eating bacteria and you can actually see the fuzzy edges as it breaks down the hydrocarbons. So I ran these tests and over a four month period I had in those buckets oil and kerosene levels from uh, 6,000 up to 12,000 uh, milligrams per kilogram. Those are very high levels. And over about four months, the bacteria operated on this stuff. And look at the line from the blue initial high levels of contamination. Follow the red arrow down to the purple remediated levels where the oil is essentially entirely gone. So, with this knowledge, what I could now do is dig up all of that additional oil-contaminated waste and uh, the uh, Nature Center hired a company to do this. They put it in big piles uh, along the edge there of the property, and this is one of them. They mixed in the uh, muck from the wetland and let the bacteria do its job. And that is a remediation success story.
So I just want to highlight the fact that oil is everywhere and its products and it's continuing to contaminate the environment at a very high level. And I just want to play you this little clip about a carbon footprint. Our ecological footprint threatens our efforts to preserve the Niagara Escarpment region even as these actions impact our quality of lives. Just look at this. The average American has an ecological footprint of 5.6 Earths. That's how many Earths we eat to maintain our lifestyles. That means we need 4.6 Earths to continue living the way we live. We take these equivalent Earths from other people living elsewhere in the world. We are not living sustainably. So sustainability, actively addressing the environmental remediation and protection of the environment, fortification and resilience of the community, and economic parity and equality and balance. This is how you should manage your projects and think about everything. Now the second remediation site I'd like to take you to is in Tennessee in the United States. So both of these sites are in the U.S. This is a hexavalent chrome contamination site. It's a landfill site, a multi-use landfill site in Tennessee in the U.S. And the contamination is because the landfill is leaking. So this is a multi-use landfill, so there's a lot of junk in it. There was a toy and a bike factory nearby that was doing chrome plating on metal and chrome got into the system. There was additionally a metalworks thing that also used chrome and other heavy metals. A paint factory, uh, it was an old one so some of those paints had lead in them. And we find contaminants in this uh, landfill, and you're looking at the grassy cap here, of nickel, chrome, and zinc, and cadmium, and lead. The cap is leaking and there's no underliner, so there's no protection of the groundwater. And there are numerous seeps from the now saturated landfill. So we're going to zero in on hexavalent chrome because this is the most dangerous thing we found in this landfill. It is a heavy metal. And of course the EPA makes sure that you know that hexavalent chrome is a cancer causing agent. It is dangerous. When you get exposure to chromium-6, it can cause lung cancer, liver damage, reproductive problems, developmental harm. It's a hazardous material. So we're going to be looking at chrome-6, which is a dangerous one. And then we're going to look at chromium-3, a reduced member of the chromium family. This is less dangerous and in small amounts can actually be a micronutrient. So here at the site, uh, this is a very simple geologic map. Now the shaded area is the area of the uh, leaking landfill. And you can see that it actually is around and cut by several shallow streams. The stratigraphy is important to understand here in the geology. So when you attack one of these problems, make sure you look at the hydrology, the geology, the soils, all aspects of the ecological environment as you design your remediation system. So here we have a residuum top, just debris of sediment and, and so on and so forth. But then we have a couple of limestone layers uh, separated by a shale layer. Now these limestone layers are easily water soluble. They have lots of small caves and open fractures. So the water can very easily transport any surface contamination to the groundwater. So what's the groundwater doing? Well, the, they put this landfill on a ridge and it's actually on a groundwater divide. Surface water and groundwater flow to the left and to the lower portion of the diagram away from that central red line. The shaded area towards the top is the landfill itself. Zooming in on this a little bit, what we see is it's a complex hydraulic situation and that little stitched like black ziggly line there, that is the creek into which all the runoff goes. So we have a real hazardous situation that has formed here from leaks in the landfill going directly into a small creek. We also see in the picture on the right the capping membrane that they used long time ago 
is actually torn up, damaged, ripped, and missing in many places. And we also see, as the picture on the left shows, deep erosion in these creeks and just a grassy cap in the middle. So this picture here shows you the edge of the landfill, the headwaters of the stream right at the edge of the landfill, really a bad design actually, and then a forest off to the left. It looks okay until you look at it closely. Now when you get in those streams, you start to see some significant erosional problems. This is gullying down, and this has further exposed edges of the landfill. We've looked at the landfill area, outlined in red, the light green grassy area, and the seeps are all flowing down to where you see the blue numbers. That's the creek in the forest, just above, in the picture, the grassy area where the landfill is. Just zooming in, you can see our sample areas and cross sections of the stream. As we walk down that slope from the landfill to the stream, we encounter this kind of a situation. It's hummocky with a forest on it, and where you see one, two, three, and four, and so on, those are seeps that are carrying toxic heavy metals out of the landfill towards the stream channel that's situated on the bedrock. Now remember that bedrock is a limestone and it's full of holes. It's, it's a karst, K-A-R-S-T. It has open fractures and small caves in it. So as we look at one of these seeps, you see a whole lot of things going on here. Now you can see on the lower right diagram a, a little puddle of water because we've dug this out and we wanted to get a water sample from here and we did this on all of the seeps so we collect that water. We're using gloves and protective gear because uh, hexavalent chrome is quite dangerous. Zooming into that spot and along that seep, you can see a lot of iron oxide. That's the red stuff. That's seeping out of the landfill. Now that iron oxide is accompanied by lead and zinc and hexavalent chrome and all these other metals, cadmium and so on, that we've detected in the sampling. The muck in the seeps is easy to sample, and we stick that into uh, containers, as shown on the left, and then we also sample the water on the right. The sediments in the seep area are mostly silty clay sand. They're not very cohesive, and there's a lot of organic matter in them as well, which is why they're dark. In a cross-section of the soils there then, you can see the various soil horizons and that black organic zone just below the leaf litter at the top. Then you go down section and you see a little bit of reduction, some uh, darker grays and things like that, but not a whole lot of that because the water is really sieving through this area and bringing those contaminants down to the water table. Analysis of the seep sediment showed, in fact, as you can see here, the spikes are total chrome, hexavalent chrome, and nickel. And so we're getting spikes in portions of the stream as we follow the seeps. And here I just wanted to point out that EPA, Environmental Protection Agency information, there is the no observed effect concentration, that is Below that, the EPA doesn't really regulate a lot of these things, or it says it's there and we'll watch it. But we can see the chrome numbers just jumping very much above that NOEC level. So we know we've got a problem. In addition to that, we see seeps not just coming through to the surface, but where the stream has eroded and cut through everything, we see heavy metals precipitating out as they come out of the ground in the erosional cut. Here you see manganese accumulations, and in that manganese is hexavalent chrome. Uh, it makes that black oxide, a manganese oxide, like pyrolusite. Here as well, we see minor elements that we are concerned with, manganese, barium, chromium, and here in these seeps, we have the analysis of minor elements. Now, the minor elements do include metals of concern, such as chrome. And again, as we look at these seeps, we see that levels of concentration exceed the EPA minimum levels of acceptance. So we have a real problem here again. 
This is another seep. The landfill is behind the trees and under the trees, and all of that leafy litter is muddy, saturated, and full of contamination. Now, as we go down to the creek, we uh, encounter actual exposed limestone bedrock. Those are those shelf-type outcrops of rock that you see here. So the contaminants are also getting directly into the fractures and karst of the limestone. That's really bad news. So here in this diagram you can see the limestone, the Fort Payne limestone, uh, and the water going through the landfill, through the residuum, that surficial stuff in the soil, into the creek and into the groundwater system. And again, we've sampled all of these, and there's quite a few of these graphs, but I just want you to notice the spikes. These are peaks in total chrome and hexavalent chrome as we look at these, and as well as nickel. So we're tracking these heavy metals very carefully in a number of seeps, and we pick them up in some of the monitoring wells as well. Here again, you see a ledge of that limestone that the water is flowing directly over and the contaminated water is going straight into the groundwater system. And again, uh, further down in the stream, we see more of these contaminants. And here again, it's total chromium, chromium-6, and nickel, as well as the host of minor elements. So we document the whole stream and the sediments and the soils in the forest and in the landfill itself. So if we look at a quick little simple cross-section, we get an idea of what erosion has done here. It's made these eight-foot and two-foot cuts, and this is working its way right into the landfill. So if this keeps going and we don't fix this, this whole thing will bust open and contaminate all the downstream water supplies. We also want to look at concentration levels and how we can reduce hexavalent chrome. So there's uh, rates of reduction that occur that have been tested in acidic wetland-like environments. So we're going to dive into that a little bit. So I made some phase diagrams. This one is for chromium. It's an EH and pH diagram. And the green boxes on the pink, yellow, and purple vertical stripes, which is where we find our pH of our waters, the stream and the groundwater and the seeps all have slightly different uh, pHs depending on how much they've interacted with the limestone, which buffers acidic solutions coming from the uh, leaky landfill and raises the pH a little bit up towards neutrality. Putting the chromium diagram next to the nickel diagram, we can see that again the pH and the range, we can see what species of chrome and nickel we have there, and we can confirm that with further analysis, and then make these diagrams and refine them. Now I said there was a lot of iron in this water. As you can see in the red muck on the right from a seep, that iron is also accompanied by a lot of other heavy metals, and we have to address that. So we have iron oxides and iron hydroxides that we have to deal with. And I mentioned the black manganese oxides. Those are also a species we have to deal with. So a quick refresher on redox reactions. Now redox reactions are the transfer of electrons. Oxidation is the loss of electrons and reduction is the gaining of electrons. Reducing agents is electron donor, and the oxidizing agent is the electron acceptor. And for many redox reactions, the reduced species has a lot of hydrogen ions, the H pluses. And for redox reactions, the oxidized species has a lot of oxygen atoms. As we went down the stream, we encountered in some of the small seepy wetlands salamanders. Now salamanders are hypersensitive to contamination, so when we find salamanders, we know something good has happened. What good has happened? Something is reducing the hexavalent chrome. So let's take a look at this. Let's take this pH field, alkaline pH 14 in the upper left, and acidic pH 1 
at the lower right and overlap this with an EH field so that we can see the millivolts of CO2 and of oxygen on either end as well. And then we're going to put our chrome 6 at the top and our chrome 3 at the bottom. And we need to get there by reducing the chrome 6 to chrome 3. So how are we going to do that? All right, reduction of chrome 6 to chrome 3. Well, we, uh, we have a species like chromium chloride, and we're going to make another chromium chloride. But since the, the state, uh, the electron state of this is different, one is CrCl6, chrome 6, and the other is CrCl3. Now there is another chrome compound that we find in our waters, that's Cr207. And we know that there's free chrome and chrome 6 tied up in some of these oxides and hydroxides. So this combines with organic matter in which there's bacteria and the hydrogen ion, that's acidity, and it forms chrome 3 through the reduction reaction and form CO2. So this reaction actually remediates the chrome 6 and the chrome 3 can act as a micronutrient. Remember those salamanders? That's what they're telling us. So to confirm this we sampled a number of species. Uh, the rootlets, uh, bark, leaves, and twigs. This graph is a list of some of the species we sampled. The red maple, the spice bush, the Chinese privet, and the elderberry. And one of the things you can see is how they are bringing in the hexavalent chrome and we sampled these twigs and roots and found that they had converted it to trivalent chrome, the micronutrient one. They also helped operate on some of the other heavy metals in the wetlands. Now there are too many bacterial species to count. But in our analyses, we got a whole lot of very well-known bacteria species. Here's a list of them on this yellow chart. By understanding this whole process, we realized we had to make some artificial wetlands that would become, you know, natural wetlands in time. And in doing so, what we would do, we would design the wetlands behind uh, limestone dams that we would construct, make them as natural looking as possible. And here you can see the basic designs of this going on here. So as we go through these designs, we had to calculate the volume of water, the volume of vegetation, the rate of redox reactions going, and scale all these so that the wetlands could ultimately be built, which they will be built at some time. They are not yet built. So that's the presentation I wanted to tell you about uh, in terms of application of bioremediation uh, resources and using natural occurring bacteria in wetlands and uh, to remediate oil and heavy metals and in fact it can remediate many other things as well.